You're listening to Impulse to Innovation. The Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Helen Mees. As a global community of mechanical engineers with over 120,000 members in 140 countries, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers has been at the heart of the engineering profession since 1847. The Institution's mission is to improve the world through engineering by sharing the latest news, views and insight into the creative world of technology and the people that make it happen. As a global community, we are constantly facing both present and emerging threats to our technical, organisational, societal and economic ways of life. These threats can be natural, such as earthquakes or storms, man-made, such as poverty or lack of resources, and in our ever-growing, technically driven world, they can affect our data and computer networks. Living in such complex systems of systems Engineers are having to find new ways to protect us from these threats and ensure we can absorb and adapt to the challenges as quickly as possible after the threat has passed. In this month's episode, we will be exploring how we keep society safe, what effect remote working has had on the way we manage and monitor our infrastructure, and what engineers are doing to protect safety-critical technologies from cyber attacks. My guests this month are engineers Andy German and Pete Stewart. They both work for Atkins, part of the SNC Lavalin Group. Pete is a chartered engineer and fellow of the IMACI and a board member of its Safety and Reliability Group. He has a master's degree in nuclear science and technology from the Royal Naval College Greenwich. Pete's career has focused on high hazard industries, particularly the UK nuclear and oil and gas. He is currently the Discipline Lead and Chief Engineer for Nuclear Safety Assurance within the Resilience Engineering Practice. Andy is also a Chartered Engineer with the Institution of Engineering and Technology and is a member of the Safety Engineering Technical Network. He has an MSc in Aerospace Safety Engineering and he works as the Professional Head of Discipline for Resilience Engineering, including system safety and safety critical software within aerospace, defence, security and technology. I started by asking Pete about how engineers keep our technology and workforce safe and what this vital yet complex branch of engineering really entails. Pete and Andy, thank you so much for joining me today. In my introduction, I talked about how important it is as engineers that we ensure our workforce and the country's infrastructure and mission critical equipment are kept safe and operational in times of crisis. This need has been brought into sharp focus in the last 12 months. So, so how do we go about balancing the need for productivity against ensuring our safety? Now, I understand that you have a very specific name for this, don't you? Could you explain to our listeners what that is? Resilience engineering has um, many meanings in a, in a wider engineering sense, but in general, it's the ability to absorb uh, or avoid damage without suffering the output. Specifically, where Andy and I work in Atkins, uh, we think of uh, resilience engineering as a compilation of many disciplines which cover things such as safety assurance, environmental assurance, the input of reliability, human factors, cyber security, explosive security, and a whole range of engineering disciplines brought together under one umbrella to describe how we protect that infrastructure and people um, against um, the hazards or the risk profile that it sees. Wow. As an engineer, you have to be very aware of lots of things going on there, don't you? There's a lot of people um, and uh, across each of those disciplines, we have uh, discipline leads which all come together and focus through effectively Andy's role, which is the, the professional head of our discipline. And he sits uh, at the almost the apex of the uh, the pyramid beneath our, our director or the practice, uh, as we call them. So Andy's position has the advantage of being able to look across all of those disciplines when we are addressing 
individual problems or inputs or questions from our clients. And when we go out to the market to talk about it, uh, it gives us a focal point for that whole variety of what we might think of traditionally as safety related uh, disciplines, but yeah. which we call uh, resilience because it brings together far wider selection of disciplines than just the pure safety aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for explaining that, Pete. Andy, obviously, we as engineers uh, can design all kinds of fail safes and protection systems to monitor machines and, and our environment. But, but what happens when we introduce humans into that equation? Surely that can cause all kinds of unpredictable situations. So h- how do you go about mitigating for that? So, you know, we're dealing with these complex socio-technical systems and we need to make sure that we understand the human's involvement at all levels in the system because management decisions and decisions you take uh, as operators can have far-reaching effects in these these complex systems now, uh, as well as ha- how people interface with them uh, in a good or bad way. So we, we will talk about some of the cyber vulnerabilities a bit later on and those sort of things that we need to, to think about. So, so clearly, uh, on the whole, in safety and, and other areas, we, we think about the bad things the human can do to the system. But also we need to think about how the system is quite flexible, or the human is quite flexible, I should say, in terms of its, you know, the human's ability to overcome some problems. So we need to take benefit from the human as well as trying to understand what the human might do to the system. So human factors becomes quite important to this and modelling human factors into the whole system uh, using different techniques is, is, is quite important in, in this approach. Yes, I, I was always told as a young engineer that uh, no matter how many uh, systems you mitigate or issues you mitigate for, that a human will always find a way through. So, <laughs> so it's good to know that you're you're really focusing on those human factors and that interaction between um, the machine and and the human. Yes, and, and in particular, you know, we we need to understand how the people are trained to use the the system that they're involved in. And this is at all levels again, and about how they make decisions within that system environment and how we understand that they've got the right information. So so one of the things, one of the advantages we've got is that we can use t- new techniques to bring data together and allow them a better understanding of what the system's up to. So during design, we can use model-based systems engineering to bring those disciplines that, that Pete talked about together and understand what the effects are on the um, the system itself. And then obviously design the system to meet those requirements and give those outputs. And as we get into service, then we can use things like digital twins to provide you better information or to simulate what's going on or to allow you to undertake what-if activities. So we've got uh, some new tools in our armory that we should be exploring to be able to think about resilience in a a more holistic way than we do as individuals in our specialisations. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. This is this is something that's not just uh, about a single person, but it's about the community, the the environment that we work in, all of the people that are involved to actually be able to implement these kind of processes. Now, Pete, this year has been unprecedented in terms of the way we work and interact, particularly in industry. Have there been any noticeable impacts on the the typical interactions between humans and mission critical equipment, for example, and and how has that manifested itself? You're, you're absolutely right. Um, this year has brought into focus, sharp focus, the uh, the need to understand what human interaction we do need with critical infrastructure, and that that can range from power stations, nuclear power stations, nuclear installations transportation infrastructure, infrastructure that supports the national security. Uh, the defence world have had a real a real problem in, in some respects in terms of um, reducing the human interaction. And what we've seen is that where the uh, mission critical activities are, are absolutely essential and, and unavoidable, organisations, uh, including regulators and organisations that deliver that service, have had to look very closely at what interaction was perhaps absolutely essential and what was a luxury and, and perhaps was a nice to have in terms of involving too many humans or 
too many humans too often. In, in, a, in a particular example, um, not that long ago, back in October of last year, I think at one of the um, uh, Hazard Forum events, the ONR were particularly open with um, their views and experience uh, with particularly Sellafield site. As this um, lockdown, the pandemic developed, they, they re- recognized that their normal routine inspection and regulatory activity on that particular site uh, was going to have to change because they weren't going to have such free and easy access to the, the site uh, because it'd been appropriate. So they had to revisit their whole uh, inspection and regulatory regime around about minimizing the human impact, minimizing the uh, the number of their staff uh, traveling to interact with uh, Sellafield site staff. If we go back to the defense uh, world again, of course, a lot of the defense activities are very labor intensive and manpower intensive. Taking a ship or a submarine to sea involves large amounts of people being boxed up in, in a fairly small area. So you really do need to be careful about how those individuals behave before they deploy and go onto the ship and how that uh, ship is operated or managed. And I think the example of that is that a couple of the uh, American carrier groups um, suffered because there was an infection on board and upwards of, I think it was about 30 or more percent of the uh, ship's company somehow became infected. And the commanding officer had to bring his, uh, his ship back to harbour and told the US Navy authorities that he wasn't able to fulfill his mission because he didn't have enough people of the right qualification to uh, to continue that. So it's forced people to think about that very important human interaction. Uh, what is essential and how do we provide that essential service and think about how we might provide the alternative, which is the nice to have stuff. I think that leads into some of the stuff we're going to talk about later in terms of digital control, digital management of data. And if nothing else, the COVID uh, pandemic allowed us to perhaps accelerate our thinking in terms of, well, why do we need to have somebody doing that activity if we can control it remotely and put in place all of the security around that activity to allow us to remove the individual from hazardous area or arduous working conditions? Or, or just alleviate the, uh, the tedium of a, of a human factors kind of uh, input to that. So it has manifested itself in terms of not being um, so intensive and forcing us to think about how we might deliver that alternatively through technology. And that, that in itself presents to us uh, another set of challenges. Yes, I think it's really opened up our eyes to understand when and where people need to be involved in situations and and, and not necessarily for the right reasons. So in some respects, the the recent crisis has, has actually given engineers some real interesting problems to solve, hasn't it? Yes, absolutely. And as I said, I think it, it it's accelerated that thinking and given given us the, the, the levers to to push and challenge slightly more uh, easier, more easily than we, we might have found it. Um, because the stark reality is um, a human being isn't able to be quite so flexible in, and we've always done it that way. Therefore, we're going to continue doing it that way in terms of logging data, watch keeping on critical systems, being there because there's always been a human interface there. There's always being a human in the warehouse or in the depot there's a lot of um, discussion at the moment in terms of uh, autonomous vehicles, and I think we'll talk about that later again. But of course, if you can remove the human from that or that 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 vessel or train or car or plane or taxi, then you remove a whole range of of human related hazards, but you present yourself with a whole new set of technology challenges. And this pandemic has allowed us to focus on, by default and necessity, those technology challenges that we need to face to get all of this stuff and technology working in our favour and allow us to remove the human being, which I think most human factors uh, professionals would agree is is perhaps the the wild card and the most unpredictable member of the um, the, the safety chain um, in, in any system, um, albeit that at the other end of that spectrum, we are also very versatile at noticing things that perhaps our digital twins might not be quite so good at grabbing because we're intuitive and we're nascent. But yeah. that said, um, we do remove a, a very weak link if we so choose to do so and put the safeguards and the 
protection back in a technology sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, I know many of our listeners will be thinking about the security aspect of ensuring a system is resilient. Cybersecurity is is one of the biggest areas of concern for safety critical service providers. Indeed, it's believed that manufacturing companies account for nearly a quarter of all ransomware attacks. But equally, our healthcare systems are suffering similar security issues, and more than 93% of healthcare organisations are experiencing data breaches and have been doing so for the last three years. So, Andy, what sort of critical infrastructures are being affected by these kind of attacks? And what are the, what are the medium to long term implications for cybersecurity? Most people think of cyber as being about IT, yeah. information technology, um, and most people think about how we protect that information technology. And the belief up to a few years ago was that if you got that right, then you could protect the operating technology, the safety-involved technology within that network itself. But that changed, particularly in 2017, where we saw an attack specifically targeted at an industrial safety instrumented system, and the attack was called Hatman. So it's, it's quite well documented as an attack, but clearly that was specifically aimed at a safety system. So all of a sudden, over the last few years, we've gone from looking at the information technology now to thinking about how do we protect the operating technology within those networks? Right. Um, and that requires quite a bit of, uh, of, of common work with the safety people, if you like. So the risk management process at the managerial level is very, very similar. And even at the risk assessment level is, is quite similar. It diverges once we get to the mitigations that you're going to put in place. But what it does require is that we start trying to join up the safety and the cyber people and the other people involved, the, the human factors people, other, and you can see why that drives us to this resilience sort of conversation in itself. Uh, and then we've seen other attacks since then on all sorts of infrastructure, particularly oil and gas, but train systems and dams and all sorts of other safety-involved systems that are quite well documented now. So there is a need for a critical infrastructure in particular to think about these problems and think about them in a joined up way. Yeah. So Pete, Andy's just described there some of the the issues associated with, with these infrastructure breaches, but but how do these get addressed by engineers like yourself? It is a good question, Helen. And I think uh, we alluded to it uh, slightly earlier in, in, in the, uh, the podcast. Um, we spend an awful lot more time uh, looking collectively with our resilience um, colleagues across those disciplines and particularly with cybersecurity involvement and security inputting into what we do from a design phase or a justification phase uh, much, much earlier than we would have considered it beforehand, I think. It's, it's about changing the way in which we, we think in terms of the, the manner in which we need to protect those systems and remove the potential for hacking or a security breach into a critical system. And you may well come down to the conclusion that at some point there still needs to be an individual sat monitoring the security systems and the the, the cyber activity that's going on controlling that particular operation. If you put a human in the control room, there is still somebody who can remove the control if need be from an automated system or prevent the development of a hack in a security sense. And I think a couple of places we've seen, even in the last 24 months, it's more um, prevalent than perhaps we were aware of. But the last uh, instance I recall seeing was a water treatment plant in the in States where actually the, the gentleman who was watchkeeping or controlling from a control room perspective started to see his mouse move on the screen and it wasn't anything he was doing. And as a result, he was able to uh, prevent the contamination of a water purification plant. So it's about being aware and involving the uh, the cybersecurity team and expertise far earlier so that we can build that into what we're talking about doing from a very much a paper design and including it from the outset as, a tr- as opposed to trying to bolt it on at the end. So it's a mindset for us more than anything. 
So it's it's about building that redundancy into the system and understanding that sometimes you, you have to have that human involved, but the machine might be able to do quite a bit. So having those redundant systems can really make a difference. It can. And you're absolutely right. That there, there will be a lot of instances where you won't be able to remove the human being input at some level even if it's an hourly visit to a processing plant or an hourly visit to the facility, because of the incredibly complex and uh, resourceful nature of human beings, you'll never be able to recreate that successfully without making the whole system vulnerable to attack in a cyber sense, I fear. So whilst there are vulnerabilities in a human sense, and also in a uh, an AI sense, we are all far more collectively prepared to accept that and are comfortable with that than we would be with having the whole system controlled in a in a digital sense and therefore vulnerable to a, a cyber attack. So it's about that sort of mindset, thinking that yes, we can do an awful lot of things remotely and in a virtual sense and in an AI sense. But a lot of people still feel very comfortable about ultimately having a human being sat as the final sanction with a a stop button or a kill button or whatever it is that puts control back into the human hands at the end of the day. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now, I I read that that UK businesses face over 600,000 breaches in their systems just last year alone. That equates to an attempted attack every 46 seconds. Now, no human is going to be able to deal with that kind of bombardment, Andy. So are we going to have to put our faith in machines much more in the coming years? And what impact will these things like machine learning, for example, and AI have on dealing with cybersecurity issues? We will need to design our systems to be secure, uh, and and we use the term secure by design uh, as part of the mitigation. And uh, we we also need to design the mitigations in. And also the disturbances, as you say, from cyber attacks are far more frequent than those that we normally see from a safety point of view, where we end up with a normalization of risk or the maintenance didn't happen as you expect, or there's an outcome from the system of system that arises that you didn't expect. What we see from cyber is that there's a much more relentless level of change or uh, attack on the systems. Uh, And so one of the things you can do is you can start to use machine learning to look at lots of different variables across your system, and an AI in particular, um, because they can look at cubes of data, large amounts of data that the human wouldn't be able to look at. They, they do it tirelessly, and they can start to do some predictions um, through that, that information and allow the human again to make some decisions about whether that is a problem or not a problem as they see it. So I think that there's going to be big benefit from the use of AI as part of the armory to to aid people's understanding of large amounts of data. I mean, the large amounts of data are a problem in themselves, but you, you can see that without machine support for these very complex systems of systems that we're coming to, it, it will be difficult to always find some of the issues. And cyber itself, uh, as an approach, always suggests that there are zero days, there are unknown unknowns that will come and and be found. So resilience also needs to be thought of in terms of dissimilar systems and multiple dissimilar systems, which goes against some of the systems engineering approaches we've been taking in the past, where we've been looking to make systems similar and then cheaper to to run and look after. So we, we end up with different conflicts. Again, the poor engineer needs to to work out, you know, it's always the least bad solution the engineer ends up with rather than being perfect in any one area. Yeah, I can understand that, that that actually we're starting to look at more bespoke systems rather than repeatable systems. That's something where I suppose AI will will come in, won't it, where it will be able to assess vast amounts of data very quickly in order to to see the patterns and and understand what's going on. And, and then offer those patterns back, but it's going back to a human to make the decision. Clearly, you can put some triggers in and you can see when things are going out of control. So we end up looking at systems in, in, in quite an old-fashioned way. But as you see data move around and you see unexpected data being moved around, then you can start making decisions about what you should do about that. And the, the whole point of resilience, again, is, is how do we take a disturbance, be it cyber or from something else, 
um, bring the system back online pretty rapidly to carry on giving the service that you need right across our critical infrastructures. Yeah. Now, if we're going to see more reliance on machines to protect other machines, will this lead to um, a more integrated resilience case for safe operations, Pete? I believe it will, and I hope so, because it allows us to, rather than create a safety case for a particular operation or a particular facility or equipment based on the traditional thought of uh, what the hazards might be in terms of fire floods, uh, famine, power interruptions. It forces the engineers and uh, people like myself to think about the wider picture. And whilst it potentially makes that case an awful lot more complex, if you get the right ingredients into the mix at the earliest point and consider the human factors, the cybersecurity, the traditional uh, safety, the environmental aspects, you start to produce a much richer picture, much more early in the design process. And then we can work something which is truly integrated as opposed to trying to bolt it all on as something comes out uh, at the end. So bolting things on to an existing safety case, for instance, is always fraught with danger and and doesn't always end up with the right answer. So creating a resilience case which captures All of the disciplines we talked about at the top of the podcast will be a step forward and will aid our thinking in terms of how we protect and capture those points that Andy just raised in terms of the AI recognizing that there's been a data disturbance or something it wasn't expecting or a cyber attack. One of the interesting uh, experiments or, or tests that's about to kick off, I think, which will help us in some small way, is the AI Captain Voyage, which is um, due to sail from Plymouth in the West Country to Plymouth in the United States around about April of this year, in fact. It's an AI vessel. So it's it's an autonomous vessel, and it's got uh, an AI capability such that it will be working out how to deal with the weather, shipping, other activities that we we can't actually pre-program into it. So it's going to have to learn as it goes. The data that comes out of um, that expedition uh, will hopefully assist in terms of, well, how well did the AI package cope with taking an autonomous vessel from uh, the West Country to the East Coast of the States? Bearing in mind the North Atlantic is is a pretty variable place in terms of weather, sea state, other shipping. Yeah. Uh, and on all sorts of things can happen to it. So I think as we start to explore and push these autonomous vessels, um, aircraft taxis or whatever it's going to be, we're going to learn so much about how the AI world has developed and how well it is able to replicate, if you like, the things that we take for granted as a a single-headed sailor, perhaps, uh, taking the same boat across the, the Atlantic. So I think it's going to bring together a lot of um, a lot of learning, and I look forward to be able to see that it's, it's not a safety case that looks at uh, traditional safety in a nuclear sense or an environmental sense, but actually you create a case that looks across the whole uh, set of those disciplines, and that includes the cybersecurity. So I think you're right. It will lead to that resilience safety campaign or safety case, whatever it's called, but I think it will be a a suite of documents that are far more broad in their outlook than we currently see, perhaps. Yes, and I think um, as we move forward, what we'll see are electronic safety cases. So rather than snapshots in time where the data is relatively cold, if we start moving towards digital twins for safety, we can start seeing the connected data uh, and having safety decisions supported with, with what I'd call hot data that's represented in such a way as you can start understanding the system uh, on a more day-to-day basis uh, and make better decisions around what you're going to do next, what you're going to invest in. Uh, and typically, these digital twins help us reduce some of the, the problems we see. So typically, you see a reduction in unplanned maintenance um, by 30, and, and, and some people might even claim much higher percentages than those, right. and also plan maintenance you can see um, being reduced as well. But that means we're keeping closer to the design intent of the system, which then makes the system safer. It's as we drift away from design intent over time, which tends to happen with management decisions, with operational decisions, 
uh, with maintenance decisions, those sort of things, that we end up putting ourselves at greater risk. Clearly, what we want to use are digital twins to help us make better safety decisions. Well, I, I'm very excited about hearing and seeing this uh, this vessel going across uh, across the ocean, Pete. So I'm I'm quite excited about that, just from an engineering point of view. But you, you're quite right. This issue, Andy, of of spec drift. Um, we all know as engineers that what we kind of put down on paper as the initial requirement doesn't necessarily end up that way. And so being able to create things like digital twins will really help us to kind of draw back to what the original requirement was. And I think that's going to be a tool that we see much more of in the future. And I suppose speaking of the future, to both of you really, what, what are the, the latest tools and technologies that are helping engineers like yourselves and service providers uh, to shift away from these very intensive human interactions that you've been talking about to, to more remote management of our infrastructure? And what can our listeners do to ensure their work environments are more resilient? I think from my perspective, we've we've touched on some of the tools that, that we are working with and developing and and for certain the the tools that we use at the moment are developing at a pace. I think Andy has has talked about um digital twins. As a uh, an engineering community, uh, we love creating data and we love managing and storing that data, but actually what we need to learn to be uh, better at perhaps is capturing the right data and using that data to inform our decisions rather than just storing it for the sake of storing it. So there's a wealth of information that we actually already capture and we don't perhaps use well enough. The drive towards the digital design platforms, the use of digital twins, particularly when you can uh, model some of the more hazardous uh, activities that we might want to design where you can allow your engineers in a virtual environment to walk through that facility as many times as they need to practice what they need to do in either an inspection or a maintenance activity without having to be in that hostile environment or in that um, dangerous environment. In the past, we've probably had to rely upon building mock-ups and making it as perhaps uncomfortable as it needs to be in a model world so that we can get the operators to practice. But actually, if you can do it in a virtual world, you can walk through, you can understand how far or how long it takes to walk that distance from the airlock to the point of inspection. You can do an awful lot more of remote inspections as well, drone technology and the ability to capture high quality data outputs from remote inspections with drones or with um, other mechanisms underwater in areas that we might already or previously would want to put a, a diver or uh, an aircraft or somebody on the end of a rope. Um, we can do all of these things. So embracing that digital tool, if you like, and it's a massive toolbox in reality, Um, There's an awful lot of things that we can do in terms of the technology to improve our lot and allow us to to look at what the data that we have collected and that we're fixated with collecting actually tells us and how we maximize its use in a digital sense. The digital twin is is a fantastic opportunity to, to improve our understanding of how our designs all fit together. And apart from that, they're a really good visualization tool for end clients to say, well, what does it look like? Well, there you are. It's in a 3D model. It's the beginnings of our digital twin, but that's what it will look like. And, and in places, we've been able to show without too much difficulty what um, a construction skyline might look like in terms of the various states of build so that the, the local stakeholders and the community around which this thing is being built or adjacent to being built um, can visualize what it's going to look like. And that kind of use of the data is invaluable to taking the hearts and minds of individuals who may well be against the construction or uh, have um, concerns about what that construction will look like when it's finished is absolutely invaluable to us. So for me, the tools that we're going to talk about in in the future are going to be developments of this AI and digital twin type technology um, to visualize, maximize what we know and understand. Yeah. Andy, what do you think your ideas are for, for future technology? So I think we've got some tools that we we can reapply that that already exist for us at the front end where we can model the socio-technical system as a whole. 
with the people and the technology and the layers involved, um, such as the systems theoretic process analysis approach from Nancy Leveson, that's really helpful in getting a better understanding and can be shared between the different stakeholders from safety and cyber. Uh, and then at the back end of this, what we need to be able to do is, is tell good stories about the information and the data that we're dealing with. So there are tools out there that, that help tell a better story about the data we're gathering and allow people to investigate that in a way that it follows a storytelling approach um, and a visualization approach. And it's the visualization of data that really helps. It allows the, the what ifs to be carried out so that you can practice in a virtual world the problems that you might come across or for activities that you want to ensure will go with the least amount of problems. So virtualizing the designs and then using them to help you manage the system is going to be where we go. We can see that happening on programs such as HS2, uh, where they looked at producing some of these visualizations and helping with some of the practice runs that they're undertaking. Yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to to using more VR actually in in terms of being able to to share data and and help stakeholders understand in different ways what's going to happen and how uh, they can visualize those uh, those changes. So I think it sounds like there are going to be lots of existing tools that are out there which which you as resilience engineers are going to be bringing together to kind of solve some of these problems. So that sounds quite exciting to not have to make new technologies, but actually use things that are to hand right now that you're going to be able to solve these problems with. I think that's right, Helen. Yes, and it's the, it's the fact that we've got these cloud-capable technologies that are becoming mainstream now that allow us to do this um, sort of thinking and create these, these new representations and stories for people to understand how they can make deci better decisions and, uh, and manage the risk in a better way. I think I would just add to that, that in terms of the um, listeners and their work in terms of uh, how they make it more resilient, I think it's about uh, opening your mind and removing those potentially more traditional silos of uh, leaving design as design, having safety assessments separate, having uh, human factors, ergonomics involved, having reliability uh, separately. In terms of bringing it together, the benefits that, that individual organizations, individuals, and design teams will, will reap from this technology is actually bringing that whole resilience piece across what it, whichever disciplines that you happen to uh, be engaging with, but bring all of them together and making it a, a cohesive case, call it what you want, whether it's resilience or a dependable or, or, or just your safety case. But if you bring all those disciplines together and the tools that we've talked about earlier means that you can do it in an easier manner, then that is the true benefit to our listeners here today, I suspect, is breaking down those traditional silos, working collaboratively in tools which are designed to do that, and your output will be far more robust and resilient. Pete, I think that is a perfect point to end our podcast today. Pete, Andy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I have learned so much today on the subject of resilience in engineering. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on how not just what you do in your everyday work, but what we as engineers or even just ordinary people can do to make their environments more resilient. Thank you very much to both of you for joining us. You're welcome. That's all for this month. In next month's episode, we will be taking to the airwaves as we explore the world of telecommunications, wireless systems, and the internet of things. We will be looking at how engineers are advancing the way we communicate on a global scale and how this already omnipresent technology will change the way we live and work in the future. You've been listening to Impulse to Innovation, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers podcast. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear from you. So if you'd like to share any news or any feedback with us, then please email us, podcast at imeke.org. 
All the information on this episode can be found in the episode notes. 